This is Perspectivas Latinas, a community service of CAN TV. I'm your host, Juan Carlos Hernandez. Since 1982, Centro Romero on the Chicago's far north side has been a place where the Latino community has found a variety of resources to help develop leadership, self-reliance, and the vision to better confront the struggles of living in Chicago. Today, we have Pablo Enriquez to talk about their work. Welcome, Pablo. Thank you. Well, let's start off by talking about the history of this organization okay. and how it formed. Mm -hmm. Right, so this organization was formed, it was incorporated around 1984, but it was formed in 1982 okay. informally. Um, it was founded by a group of Salvadorian refugees. They were fleeing civil war in their country. And when they got here, they saw a very kind of basic need in their community, which is people didn't know how to read. And this, this affected them in everything. So I said, okay, we'll start giving classes. And it's this was in the community of refugees? Yes. Okay. Mostly amongst Salvadorians. Because, okay. you know, the communities stick together to give each other support, mm -hmm. especially in a time when they're fleeing from this kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. So when, when they got here, they said, okay, there's a need for literacy. So mm -hmm. they started giving classes in the basement of a church. Um, and that's how it grew. That's how it started. And while they were there, while they were teaching, they started realizing that there were other needs. Um, these people don't know how to speak English, we, and this affects everyone and everything, so we need to teach them. So that's, that's how it started expanding from literacy to ESL. Um, also, they, had, they, they needed help navigating the legal system. It's, it's so foreign to one when one gets to this country. It's, it's even not, to people here, right? Even to people here, mm -hmm. right? The purpose of a lawyer is the layman is no longer able to navigate um, the legal system. But for someone to whom this culture is foreign, Right, the legal system is situated within the culture. So if you don't even understand the culture, you're not gonna you're not gonna really understand. Well, okay, why do I need to do this paper? Why in why in this format? So, seeing that they needed help with this, legal assistance started being offered. Right, sometimes it would just be educational, and then it became a little bit more um, involved. We'll help, we'll help you with your applications. Right, and it would start with um, the temporary protective status (TPS). Right. Um, and more recently, uh, the the Dream Act or DACA. Mm -hmm. um, so deferred action. Yeah, mm -hmm. deferred action. So um, this group of um, Salvadoreños, how how big was that group? Was it like three or four, or was it several families that um, around involved in this church that said, "We need to really support um, our fellow Salvadoreños coming in from right. uh, from our country." Um, this was a community of people, but. As far as the actual founders, I believe there were about five or six. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, they're, they're, they were related by families, some of them. <clears throat> and of course, their, their families are involved. Um, it's, it's, it's a community effort. It's a family effort. So it involved everyone. Um, and as it, as it expanded, it included more than just Salvadorians. Mm -hmm. Currently, our population is uh, majority Mexican, almost by 90%. But we do, we do, we do see Ecuadorians, Salvadorians. Mm -hmm from all over, we, we're starting to get uh, more individuals from Africa, from Somalia, yeah. for instance. Okay, um, wow. Yeah. So you're helping them with um, these African folks. What are you helping them with now? Um, mostly ESL. ESL. It, it varies, mm -hmm. you know, by department and, and according to their, depending on their situation. But um, mostly ESL, the need to learn English, right? We, right. although we're we're, we're organized, you know, by Latinos, and mm -hmm. a lot of our constituency is Latino. Right. We we don't open the doors only for Latinos. Anyone who comes in and says, "Well, I, I need English. Can you can you teach me?" We'll set you up for class. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now tell me about your history with the organization. How did you get wrapped up in this in this organization? And um, right. And why? What brought you to Chicago? I know you're not originally from. Here. Yeah, I'm not originally from Chicago. I came in uh, roughly about a year and a half ago. Um, and when I got here, uh, I didn't know the city too well, so I started exploring. Um, I got a job, so I was sustaining myself, but I, I, I felt a need for another activity in my life. I, I, I felt disconnected from, from my community, especially, especially my Latino culture. So uh, I found Centro Romero on the website. I, I went, I started volunteering. Um, as soon as they, they learned that I spoke Spanish, they, they threw me into the, the <laughs> alfabetización class, which is Spanish literacy, mm -hmm. um, which is a very humbling experience, right? Mm -hmm. coming, coming from college, you know, one has the background that one has, but then when one is put you know, with these other individuals to whom learning, the learning process is still very new, and 
things like reading a sentence is so difficult for them. It's, it's humbling for one. One realizes what one has. So I, I started with that, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so tell me about your first day doing that. That must have been, you said it's humbling. Yeah. Uh, uh, what experience made you realize and appreciate what you have, but also uh, made you, uh, I guess, challenge you? Because, I mean, if it humbled you, it also challenged you. Yes, it did. Um, well, when I got there, the, the coordinator for that department said, okay, we're going to put you in this. This is the nature of the class. And I said, okay, I understand this. It's a literacy class. But um, I didn't exactly know how many people would there be, what would the f be the format or the nature of it. Um, and then I get to the group, and I, I realize that they're learning how to do long division. And, you know, I was like, oh, long division? I, I remember doing al algebra and calculus or something like that. Right. And, and they're having such a hard time with it. And I, I understood why, mm. right? It's, if this is new to you, if, if you haven't had the privilege of go, going to higher education, right? Typically, one, in, in most cases, one can reach grade school and then need forces one to work at that point. Mm -hmm. So the time difference between that and when one finally has the time to say, oh, I'm going to dedicate myself to learning how to read and write, it, catching up is difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was my first humbling experience when I had to learn how to explain these concepts. Right. How old were these students that you were working with? Were, was it, a, it was a variety of ages from maybe mm -hmm. late teens, early 20s to 40s, 50s and beyond? Oh, it's a variety. Um, because it's Spanish literacy, uh, it, it's learning how to read and write is a luxury. And when, when one is busy working, when one is busy maintaining a family, one doesn't necessarily have the luxury to say, I will take three or four hours out of my day to learn how to read and write. Right. So this means that the populations that we work with are typically older. Mm -hmm. Some of them are younger and they're struggling to build a better place for themselves in the workforce. They say, for instance, oh, I work in a factory, but I can't read and write. Because of this, I can't sign up for extra shifts. When they pass around you know, the board saying, sign up for extra shifts, I, I'm intimidated because I can't read and write, and that's why I'm here. Um, so we'll get some individuals like this, and we, the purpose is to help them overcome these obstacles through mm -hmm. education. To me, it's amazing that, um, I get, well, I guess it's part of the fact that uh, there are the reasons, one of the, some of the reasons why people immigrate, they're looking for a um, better opportunity, but it's incredible to me to think and know that um, there are people that don't know how to read in their in their well in any language and yeah. um, just how difficult it must be to navigate uh, life that way and to keep a family together. Right. Um, the Centro Romero makes families part of their main focus, right? Yes. Uh, tell me about how how programs for families work. The programs that you have for families. Okay, so uh, a little bit before that, mm -hmm. our our approach is right. is informed by. The, the educational philosophy of Paulo Freire. Freire. Oh, the Brazilian educator. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he argued that education um, needs to be more than just, here's the information, I'm filling you with it. Right. right? I'm teaching you how to adapt these standards. Mm -hmm. um, his approach was that education needs to be a process in which you tool the, the individual to make critical decisions to form part of their society and to form society, not to adapt to society. Um, empowering the individual means also empowering the family. So in our, in our focus, we, the unit is the family that we approach. So in our family services department, our, our programs um, typically encompass multiple aspects of the family. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, our newest program, the Family Literacy Program. Uh, this, this new program, it's, it's the newest program. It, it's still being implemented, but it's wonderful. Um, the, the parents are required to take an adult education class. It can be ESL, it can be GED, it can be citizenship, but they must be taking class. Their children must also be taking class. There is a required um, parent-child reading time, so a period during which they, they will do an activity. Sometimes they can do it um, both in English and in Spanish, which is very good because it gives the children an opportunity to, to practice their, their reading skills in another language. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, there's library time and workshops for the parents. So this, this encompasses multiple aspects of wow. the family dynamic, um, and that's typically the approaches we, we attempt to make. 
It's pretty it comprehensive. Uh, so tell me about uh, this. You make people, you have requirements for these families, right? Do they have to sign a form? Because it's <coughs> they have to do these certain uh, number of things, right? Yes. Um, well, we have a conversation and we say, so this is the nature of the program. This is what we're trying to do and this is why it's in this format. Um, if you're interested, you need to be involved in all these processes. And they understand. We don't, they don't sign a contract binding them to it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not about that. We're not trying to bind you to education. Right. You need to come freely or not at all, or else you, you just won't learn. Mm -hmm. And how, how do people respond to that, that conversation? It's a, uh, I mean, like you said, they don't sign a contract, mm -hmm. um, but you are asking them to make a, a very strong commitment to, to yeah. this program. Yeah, in that particular program, mm -hmm. um, it is, uh, it is a, a somewhat moderate time commitment. Um, but, well, the reactions f for, for some people, the con this approach to education is foreign, right? Educational standards and expectations vary by culture and country. So uh, one might honestly say, okay, why am I doing all this? I just, I just want my child to, to go to this after school program. Why, why is there all this, you know, these other requirements? But they do understand the, the impact and, and, the, and the purpose of this. So if, if they realize, oh, this is more time than I thought I could commit, um, maybe they'll just nod a little bit silently and then maybe um, <laughs> not show up the next day. Or they'll just say, you know, directly, I, I work, I, I can't. Mm -hmm. Is there any way I can navigate around this? And we, we try and negotiate. Um, explicitly, our mission is to offer options to those with the fewest options. So right. if a person says, I, I work during these times, I can't go, we, we try and see, okay, well, maybe you, you won't be able to come to this component, but what about the others? How much of this program can we adjust so that you still have this experience without taking away from it, basically? Right. So, yeah, that's something that um, I always think about because of my own background and seeing how my parents um, sometimes had to work two shifts or my mom had to be out of the house for some time because they had to put food on the table. Yeah. How does an organization like uh, Centro Romero adapt to such a difficult uh, work schedule that a lot of the folks you <coughs> serve have to deal with? Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, we do several things, and it varies by program and by the nature of what we're offering. Mm -hmm. So in the case of ESL, right, mm -hmm. if, if one works 9 to 5, one can't go to morning classes. So we host morning class, both morning classes and evening classes mm -hmm. to try and accommodate for, for both levels, um, similar to GED. We host morning and evening classes. Um, our legal department is um, open 9 to 9, more or less, or 9 to 8, I think. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, and it's also by appointment, so we try and be flexible in that sense to accommodate needs. Um, in addition with uh, our, our educational program, for instance, sorry, our youth program, mm -hmm. uh, one of the new components that we're including into our after school is we will now be providing lunches to the children. Um, a lot of parents were, were struggling with, well, they would have to commute to Centro Romero to, to bring their children lunches, hmm. right? Um, or sometimes that in itself is, is an obstacle. Right. So with, with, this, with this new addition to the program, we're, 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 we're providing more assistance. Okay, and um, is that the greatest challenge that, um, I guess, managing, helping people manage those schedules, is that the greatest challenge you face um, from these families? or? Uh, what do you see in them that uh, makes it difficult for them to, to actually come to Centro Romero and say, um, I need this or I need to grow in this way? So for instance, um, the GD program, mm -hmm. right? Um, for a lot of jobs, one of the requirements will say it will require GD. Sometimes um, people that already have jobs, they'll be told by their employers, hey, regulations are changing. Um, I now need to require you to have a GD by a certain date. Please go get it, or unfortunately, I'll have to let you go. Um, mm. So then, they'll start approaching it. But uh, for someone that doesn't necessarily understand how uh, one progresses in this in this country, right? Mm -hmm. um, you start developing something, and then you just go with it. But okay, so you need let's let's say you want to be a cosmetologist. Mm -hmm. To get to that, you need high school equivalent, or, right? And then you need an additional study, and you need work experience. And then you can start developing yourself, and then from there you can specialize or, or improve or expand in one way or another. 
But for someone who doesn't necessarily know this, because th this isn't the case in other countries necessarily, right. for someone to whom this process is foreign, y you know, I just, I, just, I just got done with work. I'm exhausted. It feels like every bone in my body is about to crack. Now I need to take another series of buses to go take this class. Someone's going to speak to me about, mm. you know, environmental science or something. <laughs> I, you know, and then, you know, they have a hard time, you know, motivating themselves a little bit. But they all make it. It's... I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of them for, for the efforts that they, that they put into their education. We, we treat individuals as, um, as responsible for their own actions. Mm -hmm. So if they really want, want to make a change, they will be there. And they are. So tell me about some of those experiences you've been uh, teaching and, uh, and working with these, uh, this community for mm -hmm. about a year and a half now. Yeah. Right? Uh, what's been most challenging for you as a part of this organization? Well, what is, what is challenging is, uh, well, yeah, the, the individual limitations that each person has. Um, it's, it's hard to have a class where everyone's on the same page, right? When you're in grade school, everyone's, everyone's five years old, everyone's thinking about five-year-old things, everyone's got five-year-old problems, right? <laughs> right. Um, but when you're in an adult ed class, that's not the case. That lady over there has children, that man over there just got a job or maybe has a night shift. Um, these other two people are looking for jobs or whatnot. This other person is retired and, and wants, wants to pursue further education for their own self-growth. Um, so, that's, so that's varied. And also the educational level is varied. Some people were able to go up to high school. Some people barely finished grade school before they had to go to the field to work to help their families out. So it, it makes it makes teaching them, for instance, um, a much more engaging process. You need to engage each individual um, to reach them where they're at. Okay. And what's been most rewarding about this work? You've, works, you've stuck around for, yeah. <laughs> for, I mean, you could have just gone after some time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so rewarding when it actually pays off. Mm. When, for instance, someone finally gets their GED, they're so happy. Uh, when we when we celebrate through the GED graduation, uh, our ceremony, th all the families are together. They are so proud of their mothers or their sisters or their fathers or their sons for having pursued this, um, and then for the steps that they'll take. Uh, also, for instance, you meet someone one year, and you know they're barely stuttering in English. Their preparation level just at the start. Hello, how are you? Right. Um, they walk out onto the street and they're terrified of every single person because they speak English. Um, mm -hmm. And then a year later, you hold a conversation with them. It's like, wow, how did you do that in a year? How did you get to this point? It's, 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 it's really rewarding. Um, now, besides uh, those educational uh, aspects of, of the services you offer, you also have a domestic violence program. Yes, we do. Uh, tell me about that and <coughs> why it, it exists. Um, well, we know why because of the problem of uh, domestic violence, but yeah. <coughs> how it came to be part of, domest uh, of Central, Central Romero, Romero and... Okay. Um, what you offer through this program. Right, so the, the domestic violence program is not our largest program. Mm -hmm. um, however, it exists because unfortunately it is necessary. Right. Um, it it uh, came into existence when we realized there is this need in our community um, and there are resources for this, but the nature of domestic violence and the cycle that it produces in the family unit is that access to resources is restricted. So we, we offer counseling. So the person will come to Centro Romero and, and start telling their story. So the first purpose of that, uh, well, the purpose of that first meeting is to see, okay, where is this person? What needs do they have? We, have, we very frequently refer to other institutions and organizations because they, they provide resources that mm -hmm. we don't. And right. we don't necessarily feel a need to adapt to providing those resources because other organizations do it and do it very well. So we just okay. refer them to that. But we offer counseling. So the purpose of this is to we'll give the victim space to be heard, to inform them of their rights and their options, and to empower them to make the decision to break the cycle of violence. Um, so we do the case, the, the counseling. Uh, in case that we see that there is emotional trauma, we, we do a referral for therapy. In addition to that, we do some advocacy in some court situations. We cannot replace lawyers, nor do we attempt to. but. Insofar as emotional support 
or helping this person, okay, so this is what's going to happen. We're going to ask for this. These are what you're going to mm -hmm. need, right? Be prepared to say this. This is So just the emotional support and advocating for them. We also do workshops where we give classes on, for instance, we'll give information on what exactly is the nature of the cycle of domestic violence and how it repeats and perpetuates itself. Um, as well as, you know, empowerment workshops. Uh, we, we try and give them tools. Mm -hmm. And we also have um, group therapy sessions about once a week um, so that these people can, can come together and give, give themselves support, uh, share their success stories. I was living in this situation and I lived with fear and now I don't, I'm not as scared anymore, right? And that, and that story can empower and strengthen the other women in the program and men too sometimes. Well, wow, and uh, about how many people come through this program per year? About 100 people, 115 people will, will receive counseling or mm -hmm. will be part of the program. Um, we'll have about 800 referrals, which, really? which gives you an idea. Right? Well, it's, it's the, large. It gives an idea of the scope of just how, how different can each experience be, right? So if, if they need a service that we don't offer, we'll send them to that. If they need a shelter, we, we know where to send them and that's where, that's where they'll go. Um, if what they need is what we offer, then we will offer it. Now, you, you mentioned um, you refer people out. Um, part of what I've, what I've learned about nonprofits is there's a lot of collaboration. Tell me about yes. some of the organizations you collaborate with. Whew. We collaborate <laughs> with a lot of organizations. Um, some of us, well, some organizations do similar things to Central Mero, but in different parts of the city. We, so we'll serve different areas, for instance. Some of the organizations are by culture, so you'll mm -hmm. see, I don't know, the Hindu Association mm -hmm. or uh, Greek Association, Lithuanian for help, but uh, we, we support each other through resources. If we see, okay, this person needs this and that place offers it, so we do a referral. Um, for a lot of our programs, for instance, for our career development programs, um, we, we invite other institutions that offer that. Some institutions, for instance, will offer a program where you'll, you'll study a trade for a period of time. And then part of the program is as you're nearing the end of your study period, um, you are transitioning into the workforce. Um, we do not offer that. Uh, however, we, we refer them to who does. Okay. Uh, you also have uh, programs for um, children and teens. That's part of that whole yeah. serving uh, families, right? In, yeah. You fit children and teens in there. Tell me about the programs you have for children. You have an after-school program you mentioned. Right. Um, tell me about that first. So, so to we'll give you an idea, within the sure. Family Services Department, mm -hmm. we have the Women's Program, okay. the Women's Empowerment, and then we have the Youth. Okay. So in the Youth Program, we do an after-school program for grades uh, 1 through 5. And then we do a teen program for 5th through, or 8th through 12th, I think. It's, 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 it's uh, older ages. Um, the purpose of the after-school programs is to serve as a supplement to the education they're already receiving. So second graders come out, of, come out of school, they go to Central Romero for the after-school program. The activities that we do will be related to what they're seeing in school. So we'll help them with their homework if there's any concepts that they're not understanding. And this is important because sometimes being part of two cultures, um, there's also two languages in you. Right. So grasping things at first can be a little bit difficult. You'll get much better at it later on. but sometimes that extra help is needed to understand these things. Um, right. So it'll give them a great opportunity to further grasp the concepts they're working with at school. Um, it's a wonderful program. Uh, <laughs> um, you also work, you've also worked in that program? Uh, I have not. Have not. I haven't worked everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, for teens? For teens, it is similar, but just uh, appropriate to their age. We give them workshops uh, that are related to empowerment or, or leadership. So, I mean, sometimes also practical things like here's a CPR class, here's okay. a first aid, um, here's, uh, here's a program on youth empowerment, things along those lines. Okay. Uh, and you, um, there's also this immigrant family resource uh, project, right? Do you, um, do you offer that as well? Immigrant family resources? Yeah. Um, what do you mean? Um, I, I thought that you focus specifically through Centro Romero on helping immigrant families like maybe uh, learn about their rights or learn about uh, how to... Oh, well, well, right. We do offer resources, but it's, mm -hmm. it's within certain areas based on the needs that we've seen. Okay, but it's not something right. specific that's kind of isolated from everything else. It's within the programs then. 
Um, typically, but for instance, mm -hmm. a person will come to Centro Romero and say, well, I have this problem with this document. I need some help with this. Okay. So then refer them to legal. And then, you know, in legal, they'll, they'll do whatever transaction that they need. But then while they're there, um, they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm also trying to find a job, something GED. I don't have a GED. And then we'll say, oh, okay, we'll send you to GED. We have GED classes here. They're mm -hmm. free. Come sign up. Um, and then we'll go and we'll do an assessment test and we'll, and we'll realize, okay, well, this person, this, maybe this person needs more basic literacy education. Okay. So we'll, that's so that's how we'll transition. We all communicate amongst ourselves. Um, so sometimes person will come for thing A and then they'll stay for thing B. I needed legal help. Okay. We also offer English classes and I need some English. So now I'm in English classes. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. it actually sounds like a great way to work. Yeah. Um, do you also prepare people for uh, those that are, have been here for some time and they have the opportunity to become citizens? Do you have anything that works? In yes, we do. We have a citizen workshop. Our legal department assists with the actual application, um, but part of the process is you need to take an exam and there's an interview there's right. for this process. So we offer a class to help them prepare for this process. Um, it's pretty successful. Okay. Um, Accelerations are wonderful. Every time someone gets their citizenship, <laughs> they're so happy. They just flood Central America with food. Oh, really? That's a very Latino thing to do. I'm so happy. I'm going to bring everyone I know food. So it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, um, you've, you've touched on it um, throughout the interview here. Uh, um, the Legal Services Department. Yes. Uh, uh, and you said it's from 9 to 9, uh, 5, 6 days a week? Um, not 9 to 9, about... Nine to eight, nine to seven. It varies. It varies. Um, Thursdays th is their day off. Okay. Uh, they also operate Saturday on reduced hours and Monday to Monday to Friday. Otherwise, with okay. the exception of Thursday. And uh, what do uh, what do you offer the community through this uh, right. this department? So we we focus on immigration issues. We're not going to try legal assistance of any way whatsoever. No. Right. We we focus on on immigration issues. So uh, the TPS, Temporary Protective Status, okay. that's an application that one needs to redo about every 18 months. Okay, we're almost out of time, so we'll oh, okay, get sorry. through it quickly. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, of course, offer. of course. Um, uh, application for the DREAM Act, mm -hmm. the, uh, citizenship application. We do not offer help with uh, amnesty or uh, work visas or anything of that nature. Okay. Um, we, we just try and help with transactions. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we could talk for about an hour and a half. Of course. <laughs> okay. Perspectivas Latinas is a community service of CAN-TV. If your nonprofit organization would like to work with CAN-TV, call 312-738-1400 and ask for nonprofit services. Tune into Perspectivas Latinas for local issues and concerns every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. on CAN-TV 21. I'm Juan Carlos Hernandez. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>